All right, we're going to go back to the Gospel of John tonight. The fourth Gospel, if you remember last week, I, take, I took you through a, uh, uh, just a, a kind of a, a, a simple, I didn't get in depth, it wasn't exhaustive, but I took you through the uh, Gospel of John on the subject of truth and a theme that ran through the Gospel of John about truth. And John 14, the Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh the Father but by me. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching tonight, Lord, and preaching. I pray for unction. I pray, Father, to use this time that you've given me, Lord, to glorify thy holy name, Lord, to get forth the truth of the Word of God. Not our wild speculation or men's fantasies, my Father, but thus saith the Lord, your Word. What does the Word say? I pray this now in Jesus' name, and for his sake we ask it, and amen. All right, turn to John chapter number 3 with me tonight. The Gospel of John, chapter number 3, and verse number 11. All right, let's get this. Uh, John 2, 11. John chapter number 2 and verse 11. The scripture says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Father, bless this blessed book now to the hearing of the people. May they receive it, Father, as it is in truth, the word of God, not the word of man. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. So we have here a couple of unique things. First of all, it says it is the beginning of miracles. Secondly, it says that the disciples believed on him. And of course, belief is another theme that runs through the Gospel of John. And John says these things are written that you might believe. If you remember now, I told you last week how that you have three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are referred to as synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Luke, and John have genealogies, if you want to call what it says in John 1 a genealogy. Matthew's genealogy traces the genealogy of the king. Luke traces the genealogy of the man. And John chapter number 1 traces the genealogy of God the God-man. It's a very short genealogy. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <laughs> That's got to be the shortest genealogy in the whole Bible. Amen. But it starts off by making no mistake in anyone's mind that as far as John the Apostle is concerned, the Word is God. John is a pork-abstaining, uh, uh, pork Sabbath-keeping Jew. When he says God, he's talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's talking about the one true and living God. And when John the Apostle says that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, that's who he's talking about. He's not talking about some Kabbalah, esoteric, uh, mystical, Eastern mysticism, Buddhist Hindu God. He's talking about the one true and living God. The, miracle, the miracles in the Gospel of John are uh, given to us as the first miracle that he performed. And then another miracle that he performed. They're set forth for us as sign miracles. They're signs from God. Now the sign, the Bible says, the Jew seeks after a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Gospel of John, written that you might believe. The last of the Gospels, I believe, written around the end of the lifetime of the Apostle John. I believe that the Gospel of John is unique and that it presents something about the Lord Jesus Christ that, uh, that's unique to it. Look at John chapter number 9. John 9. John chapter 9. And verse 35. Jesus heard they'd cast him out. And when he'd found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Does your Bible read that way? If your Bible doesn't read that way, then you've got the wrong Bible. Now, that's a powerful statement. 
because he's going to reveal who he is in verse 37. 36, he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. I heard a man one time say that nowhere in the Bible does the Lord Jesus Christ claim to be the Son of God. And he started a network, so-called Christian network. And when I heard that, I thought, man, you know, we can, we can say, we all mess up. We all mess up. I've messed up. We've all messed up. Believe me, when you talk as much as I do, you're going to say something and you're going to mess up. But this is a biggie. This is big. This is a big deal. Did he just claim to be the Son of God? That's as plain as it can be. Now, what gospel is that found in? That's not Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke present him as the Jewish Messiah. And that indeed is who he is. He's the Jewish Messiah. But to you as a Gentile tonight, that really doesn't mean a whole lot. First of all, most Gentiles have not a clue what a Jewish Messiah is anyway. What matters to you as a Gentile tonight is that you need a Savior. And the only Savior of mankind is the Son of God. And so therefore the Gospel of John makes it very clear He's the Son of God. Now look at John chapter number 8 and verse number 24. John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, if you have a King James Bible like mine, he is in italics. All right. You'd, how many of you know what that means when it's in italicized like that? It means that it's not in the Greek text. It means that it's been added for clarity and continuity. Literally, what you have here is ego I me. All right. You've heard the English word ego, haven't you? Ego, all right? Ego is a direct transliteration from the Greek ego. Come from Greek letter into English letter, another Greek letter into English letter. Epsilon, gamma, omicron. Ego into English. In English, it refers to that inner person, the ego of an individual. You know, that part that drives that individual. You know, the, person, the personality of that individual. Uh, if somebody said, well, he's... he's uh, he, 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 he has a strong ego or he has, you know, his ego has been uh, 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 hurt and what have you. Well, that's his persona. That's who he thinks he is and sees himself to be. All right. Now, they take the Greek text here, the Textus Receptus, has ego imi. Imi added to it is literally an emphatic way of saying, I am, I am, I am, I am. Now, that's, em, that's emphasized. Emphatic is like in, uh, the English word emphasize. They came from the, they're the same source. All right, so here's what he's saying. Before Abraham was, I am, I am, I am, I am. And they understood what that meant. They understood what it meant. But what it did also mean is, I am the great I am of the book of Exodus. Because every one of those Jews standing there that day understood that that was a direct reference back to where Moses asked the name of the Lord. He said, I'm going to go back before these people. They've been in bondage 400 years. I'm going to go back before these people and I'm going to tell them what all you've said to do. And the first thing they're going to ask me, they're going to say, who sent you? And what am I going to say to them? He said, you tell them, I am hath sent you. Emphasizing the fact, the word means, I am the eternal, existing, self-existing one. I need nothing. I depend on nothing. I am from everlasting to everlasting. When you get to the book of Revelation, he puts some, he puts some conjunctions with it. I am Alpha. I am Omega. I'm the first letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What that simply means is that I am all encompassing of all creation, that everything that has any being, existence whatsoever is included in what I have done for it. I made it and I uphold it. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter number one that all things were made by him and for him. The scripture says in Colossians chapter number one that by him all things consist. 
that he created everything there is. He who? The Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, in John chapter number uh, 8 and verse uh, 24, in John chapter number 9, the Lord Jesus Christ is laying out a very clear foundation that he is almighty God. Now, reason for that is because the gospel of John is not talking about somebody who is an earthly Messiah offering up an earthly kingdom to an earthly people with a sermon on the mount. He is all of that. But the gospel of John is not about that. The gospel of John is about the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and he is God manifest in the flesh. That's what John's about. There's nothing in the gospel of John about him being a Messiah. There are no... Uh, there are no messages about the Jewish kingdom the, upon this earth, the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of John, uh, all the other gospels have parables in them. A parable. Let me explain a parable. You know, the common definition is it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an earthly event with a heavenly meaning. How many's ever heard it described like that? Okay. Well, that's all right as far as it goes. But the fact of the matter is that a parable has a reason for existence. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to his people, he came to his own, the Bible said in John 1. When he came to them, he came presenting the kingdom to them, and they rejected the king, but they wanted the kingdom. But you can't have the kingdom without the king. So by rejecting the king, then they rejected the kingdom. And immediately, he went into the parabolic state. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ began to speak to them in parables. Why did he speak to them in parables? So that only the ones that God opened their mind and eyes could see and understand that message. So the parable was a method that God used to, to go along with the fact that he had blinded these people according to Romans chapter number 11. Remember? He blinded them. If you go to a Jew today and try to witness to him about the Lord Jesus Christ, he has a supernatural spiritual blindness like the scales on the eyes of the Apostle Paul. He has that blindness on his heart. Although when you witness to a Jew and you start pointing out Old Testament scriptures, he knows that Bible just as well as you do when you're talking about the Old Testament. But when it comes to Christ and to try to show him Christ in the Old Testament, he's blinded. And the only one that will believe is the one that God lifts the blinds from. And that's what Paul said happened to him. He said he lifted, didn't he, on the road to Damascus? What happened when he got to Damascus at the house of Ananias? He had scales come on his eyes on the road to Damascus. He couldn't see. Someone had to lead him around. But when he got to Damascus... Ananias laid, high, laid hands on him, and when he did, the scales fell off. And the Apostle Paul said in the book of 1 Timothy, he said, I am a pattern for them that should hereafter believe on him. So what you get into here in the Gospel of John is that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is because that God has revealed who he is to you. Now, I'm going to leave something with you tonight, and I want you to take it home and think about it. I want you to think about this. In the New Testament, the burden is the bride of Christ. How many agree with that? The church of God is the bride of Christ. All of these New Testament epistles, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, and so forth. Uh, some are written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, but the fact is they're all in the body of Christ. Make any difference? Everything in that New Testament is written to the body of Christ until you get to Revelation. And the, and the book of Revelation is not written to the body of Christ per se because the body of Christ leaves out of here in the fifth chapter of Revelation. Then it's written to the tribulation saints that are on the earth in the tribulation. The New Testament therefore has three clearly distinct groups of people. Three. So what is it? One is the church of God. That's us, the bride of Christ. The other is the Jew. All right, the Jew, then the Gentile. How many's ever heard it put that way? The Jew, the Gentile, and the Church of God. 
Now, when you come to the New Testament, wouldn't it be quite a remarkable thought that some of the things said in the New Testament are not directed so much toward the body of Christ as they are toward Gentiles? Think about it for a minute. If you are in the body of Christ, you were chosen before the foundation of the world to be in the body of Christ. But how many of you heard me say to you before, and I have yet to hear a word from a Calvinist, and they know I'm here and they know what I've said, and they can't handle this one. And here it is. There is not a word in that New Testament that says that just because you are not one of the elect, you're going to hell. You can't find that scripture. They'd love to find it. They'd love to simplify it. They'd like, it, they'd like things simplified, categorized, so they can push A, well, I find it under A. Push B, I can find it under B. But you're not going to take God's word and do that with it. There is no scripture in the New Testament that says only the elect are going to heaven. As a matter of fact, look at Romans chapter number 11 with me tonight. Romans chapter number 11. Now, the 11th chapter of Romans is dealing with who? Church? Who? The Jew. All right. Israel. Israel in two, in two, two perspectives. The elect and then Israel at large. Okay. Now, I want you to notice how he goes, he goes down through the text. And let's get on down here, and uh, here we go. Let's go to Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11, 13. The Apostle Paul said, For I speak to you Gentiles, all right, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, does not the Bible say, that in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Gentile. If I refer to a member of the body of Christ, I'm not going to say, now look here, Gentile. No, no, no. I look at you and I say, brother or sister. If you are a Jew and you are a born-again believer, I look at you and I say, now look, Jew. No, I say, brother or sister. You know why? Because in Christ Jesus you, it, you, you lose racial, ethnic, distinctions. We are brothers and sisters, regardless of our color or regardless of whether we are a Jew or a Gentile. How many agree with that? So who's he talking to here in Romans 11? I speak to you Gentiles. Now watch it carefully. Watch it carefully. He said, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the reconciling of them be but life from the dead? If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Now, you listen to this. Don't jump to conclusions about what you're reading. Just let that settle in for a moment. When I became a member of the body of Christ, I was not grafted in with Jews. Jews and Gentiles became one in Christ. The Bible says that he might make of twain one new man. The twain that he's talking about is Jew and Gentile folks. And that's all there is when it comes to humanity. He said, I will make of twain one new man. So when God walks into this house tonight or any house where his people are meeting, the Holy Ghost shows up. He doesn't say, well, now the Gentiles are over here and the Jews are over here. No, sir. We're all the same if we're born again. There is no distinction. But there's a distinction made here. And the distinction is maintained and watch how this thing works. Now look at verse number 18. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So this is going deeper than the body. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. 
Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. How many of you believe in eternal security? I know, brother. <laughs> exactly. So you better buckle up about what you're getting ready to read. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward you the goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise, what? Thou shalt be cut off. Do you still believe in eternal security of the believer? Do you believe that he sealed the bride of Christ in his hand? I do, folks. I firmly believe in that. Born again, and you can't be unborn again, right? Well, somebody can be cut off here. Who, who can be cut off here? Gentiles. We have an address made to Gentiles here. The address is to Gentiles. Now, most of what I'm saying to you tonight is for the benefit of the five-point Calvinist <laughs> because he's got everything categorized. You know, he's so sanitized in his doctrine and theology. And I get on the Internet and read some of their gurus and what they have to say, and there are certain questions that they will not touch because it doesn't fit. This one won't fit. It won't fit. God Almighty is calling his bride out of this world. And you are his bride. If you're born again, he's going to come and get you and you're leaving here. All right. And the gospel of John is essentially written for the bride to be born again. But when the bride of Christ is gone, who's left? Something's going to be left here, right? Absolutely. Gentiles will be left. And so will Jews. Right? If the bride is gone, something's got to be left behind or everybody's gone. Bride's gone and then he calls an end to it and Gentiles are left. And they are. So this is a passage in the New Testament that makes it very clear. Don't boast, don't brag because you can be cut off too. But here, here you are. You believe in eternal security. Now, if you're an Arminian, Church of God, well, most of them, Church of Christ and the rest of them, they'll run you to this scripture to show you how you can lose your salvation. But the Lord said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. I had a lady tell me one time I was trying to witness to about this. She said, yeah, but you can jump out of it. <laughs> Nobody can pluck you out of his hand, but if you, de if you decide to, you can jump out. <laughs> I thought, good night. That's, that's homespun theology, I guess. But you see, there are passages in the New Testament that are very strong about eternal security. But there are passages in the New Testament that say, uh, if you endure not to the end, the same, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. All of that simply means this there's another group. There's another group. There's the church, there's the Jew. And then there's the Gentile. And uh, just keep it in the back of your mind that there is another group, and that's the Gentile. And keep it in your mind that God knows who his bride is, and he's coming to call his bride out of this world, and he's going to come and get his bride, and that's who you are if you're born again. But you have a vast number of people that are going to go into the tribulation period and according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, there's going to be an awful lot of them that are going to go into the tribulation period and they're going to have the curse of God on them when they go in because they received not the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness and God's going to send them a strong delusion. He's not going to send them all a strong delusion, but there will be a number of them that receive a strong delusion. All right, now I took you over into Romans 11 land tonight to kind of stir you up and take you, make, you, make you go home and think about that. Uh, I think about it a lot. And uh, if you get the right perspective on what I'm trying to say tonight about this thing, it kind of opens doors into other passages in the New Testament. And once you get things like this begin to, uh, begin to uh, uh, come together in your mind, some things start making sense. And that's one of them. Now, the Old Testament, God's called their father. 
but very few times. The Old Testament does not present God burdened as their father. He's, the burden of the Old Testament is to present God as their God, their covenant God. The greatest relationship that an Old Testament saint could have with God is that he was Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah uh, Nissi. All of these Jehovistic combinations because Jehovah is the covenant keeping God. The Jew in the Old Testament understood that he was a peculiar people chosen from all the other people, that he was the apple of God's eye and that he had a covenant relationship with God nobody else had. This is why the sacred name, the Tetragrammaton, could only be correctly pronounced by the Jew. And to this day, folks, and let me tell you this, a lot of people, you know, they, they, uh, they, they get so arrogant about this. But to this very day, there's not a Gentile walking the face of this earth that knows how to pronounce yod he vow he without either Masoretic vowel points or whatever they add to it to pronounce that unpronounceable name of God, the Tetragrammaton. They don't know how to pronounce it. When I say Jehovah, I am depending entirely on the Masoretes. When somebody calls him Yahweh, then they are going the same route, but they took a different, they took a different turn uh, from the Masoretes. How many of you follow me on that tonight? This is, here's what's important about that. Here's what's important. What if the Jew, having his own God in the Old Testament, knowing his name and knowing how to pronounce that name, would keep that sacred to his people? And the only way that they would know it was to be born a Jew, live a Jew, and die a Jew. How many of you know what the Masoretes are? I've told you before, but how many tonight just know right off the top of your head when I, ask, when I say Masoretes, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, how many has ever seen Hebrew letters with little dots and the dashes around it? All right, the dots and the dashes are Masoretes vowel points. The Masoretes are the ones who put the dots and the dashes around the Hebrew letters so you can pronounce them, so you can pronounce them. If you go to Israel right now, I've been over there about five or six times, you'll see Hebrew everywhere but there aren't any dots and dashes. First thing I asked my guide when I went over there, I said, you know, I had, I had Hebrew right before that. I said, how come there are no Masoretic vowel points on any of this? <laughs> I said, how do they know how to pronounce that word? They're all consonants. He said, they just know. In plain words, they know how to communicate with each other and we guess when we get in there and we hope they tell us right. Are you following me? It's their language, they're in control of it, and you're not going to steal it from them. And of course, that begs the question, then, well then, preacher, do you believe the Masoretic vowel points are correct? I mean, after all, you have to have them to translate the Bible. Yes, I believe they're correct, because they have a purpose for them. Let me go a little bit further with it. Uh, you have a thing that's called the Masora. All right, now the Hebrews, old folks, the Masora is the fence to the scripture. You, how many of you have ever heard a preacher get up and tell you, well, they copied the Bible, but they'd only copy so many verses, they'd only copy so many words, and then they'd wash their pen, and then they'd go back and they'd count the letters from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence, and they'd check it with the original, the one that they copied it from, and that way the copy, every copy would be perfect. And all, how many ever heard a preacher say that? That's all right, that's fine, all right? The Masora was a document that took a page of scripture and on the sides of it, it had, it had notes, notations made to make sure that they fixed everything exactly the way it should be before they went to the next page. They knew exactly how many times that letter showed up on that page, how many times that word showed up on that page, where that word was on that page, all of that, all right? The people who did that were the sophirim from the, from the Hebrew word safar, which means to write. They're the suffering. You say, what am I getting from this preacher? You're getting about people who are very, very, very meticulous when they saw to it that their scripture was written down and transmitted to the next generation. 
Exactly. Exactly. That's what you're getting from this. So the Sophorim wrote them down, wrote it down. The Masorah is the text that has all of that information on the side of it. And this was handed down. And so when someone sat down to copy a scroll, he had all that information. He was a scribe. Just anybody couldn't do this. He had to be educated. This is why the scribes and the Pharisees show up in the New Testament is because the scribe was an educated individual. He had to be. He had to be able to read Hebrew. Most of the people spoke Aramaic on the street. See, Aramaic is a dialect akin to Hebrew, but it's not pure Hebrew. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, spoke Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, anything he pleased. But the scripture, the scripture was written in Hebrew, all right? And the priesthood knew Hebrew. The scribes knew Hebrew. And they knew exactly what they were dealing with with Hebrew. Now, let me, give you, let me give you a good illustration of this. How many of you have ever heard that during the Dark Ages, they had a Tridentine Mass that was held in Latin in the Catholic Church? A Tridentine Mass. The priest would get up and he would read Latin to the people. All right. First of all, the people were illiterate, number one. They couldn't read or write. They were completely dependent upon that priest to teach them the Bible. They didn't know anything. They couldn't read. It was to the benefit of the Catholic Church to keep them illiterate. Anybody that wants to keep you dumbed down wants to control you. My people destroyed for lack of knowledge. All right. So the priest gets up and he reads the Latin mass. They still do. The old timers do. The mass is in Latin. Why is it in Latin? Because the Roman Catholic Church is a Latin church. He reads it in Latin. People couldn't understand it. So he would get up and give a homily. A homily is where he speaks in the language of the people what he wants them to hear. But as far as those people being able to take the Bible, open it up, and read it for themselves, well, it didn't happen. They couldn't do it. They were illiterate. They were just farmhands out in the field. They couldn't read it, all right? So the priest had complete control over the minds of the people because they couldn't understand the language, the Latin, and they couldn't understand it. So they were dependent upon what he said to them. All right? That's control. But it also keeps it locked in position and in place to where, they, where, he, where he wanted it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, and he read it. And that's why, right, of course, but uh, couldn't he have just as well, and, and, and Jesus has just supposedly uh, been trying to draw up an educated partner, couldn't he as a fisherman as well? Uh, well, Peter wrote and so did uh, John. Even the, the four, I want to get to the, the four people in of uh, Israel in that day, they knew their language and they'd been instructed. Well, you see, the difference is Paul said, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, able to make thee wise in salvation. His grandmother and his mother had taught him, and the Holy Scriptures were Hebrew, and they learned it in Hebrew. They knew Hebrew when they were taught it like that. His father was a Greek, but his grandmother and his mother were, uh, you know, were, were Jewesses, and they taught him the Scriptures out of Hebrew. It's not that none of them knew it, but it's just that the common man on the street, unless he had, had access to to the knowledge and the training, he wouldn't know Hebrew. See, he wouldn't be able to sit down and read it. That's the difference. Yeah, see, that's the difference. Uh, yeah. Well, the Jewish people, uh, for the most part, were literate. They were literate. They, oh, yeah, they were literate. Uh, absolutely. Uh, they were literate. And the, the point I'm trying to make is they knew their language. 
is when he went to the synagogue and he got up and began to speak and read, he didn't read it in Latin, he read it in Hebrew, and all of them understood it in Hebrew. Certainly because it was their language. They were proud of their language. They protected their language. And to this day, it, this is mind-boggling to me, but it's a fact. This is a fact. If Isaiah walked down the streets of Jerusalem, he could understand everything they're saying. And you could take an Israeli from right now and transplant him back a thousand years and let him walk down the streets of Jerusalem and they could understand him. Now, here we are in modern English. We couldn't even understand Middle English, much less Old English. See? But they could. But the point of all of this is that they controlled and kept safe and kept their language. That for, by keeping their language and knowing what it said, then they could transmit it to the next generation. And it did not have Masoretic vowel points. All it had was consonants. Just consonants, no vowels, but they knew how to pronounce it. Bottom line, when they came to the Tetragrammaton, they knew how to pronounce it, but they never did because it was such a sacred, holy name. When they got to yod heh vau -Heh, they would say Adonai. They would say Adonai. The ineffable name. That's what it's called, the ineffable name. So here we are today. Do we have a debt to the Jew? <laughs> you better believe we do. Romans 9 says to them was given the oracles of God. I've heard people say, I wish all these Jews in hell, buddy, burning forever, got no use for a Jew. Well, then throw your Bible out because that's a Jewish Bible. Every book in the New Testament was written by a Jew, save Luke, and I'm not so sure Luke wasn't a Jew. <laughs> You know, I've read a lot about Luke both ways, a lot of controversy, good people on both sides. And it's possible Luke was a Gentile. It's possible. But it's also possible he was a, a Jew. And if, if, you know, why an exception? Why would, why would there be one person out of the Bible who's not a Jew? It's true, and there never was. They certainly do. They make reference any time that there's not, it's not purely Jewish. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. He did because he had a Greek father. Are you following what he's saying? If Luke had been a Gentile, there should have been some reference somewhere in the New Testament to it, but there's an awful lot of Awful lot of brethren out there that believe he was a Gentile. I don't. I believe he was a Jew. And uh, all, so, but here's the point Jews wrote that New Testament. <laughs> now, if they wanted to flim flam you and pull one over on you, then we'd be in trouble today, wouldn't we? Because we are completely and totally dependent upon that first century 12 disciples, those Jews, and the apostles that followed them who wrote that New Testament, we are dependent upon them to give us the Bible we've got in our hands, and we are dependent, that was written in Koine Greek, the, Greek, the New Testament was, and we are dependent upon these Masoretes to give us that Old Testament where we've got the Masoretic vowel points uh, where we can follow that and uh, give us the Word of God. I know there's a Latin Vulgate, I know all about that, that translation of the Old Testament in Latin, but the bottom line is I'm not trusting Latin. I'm, I'm going to take the word of a Masoretic and a Masoretic vowel points, the word of a Jew uh, on the letters of the Old Testament before I'll take anybody's Latin Vulgate or anything like that. I'll take that over that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And because most people put no, no emphasis on preservation. The Bible said the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of fire. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, from this generation forever. The Bible says of itself that God will preserve his word. And then the Lord when he was here said, 
the word of God, not one jot or tittle shall pass till it all be fulfilled forever settled in heaven. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I am re- do they? Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. Uh, anything that'll take your faith out of the Bible uh, came out of hell. <laughs> I don't care if he's the nicest looking fellow, the prettiest girl in the world ever said it to you. If it takes your faith out of the Bible, it was hatched in hell. I believe the Bible. And I believe God used the Jews to transmit the scripture to us. And I believe he used the school of the Masorites, which was located in Tiberias on the, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. I believe he used the school of the, of the, of the uh, Masorites to give you that Old Testament scripture without question. You've got it. You know it's there. It's a Jewish Old Testament, Hebrew, and they put the vowel points on it. I'm going to accept that, and I'm going to accept what they gave us. And when it comes to Jehovah, that's where you got it from. You got it from the Masorites with the vowel points on it. Amen. So you're awful dogmatic about that, preacher. I am. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. They don't, but brother, you wouldn't believe how many don't. You wouldn't believe how many don't. There are Bible colleges right around us that uh, cause you to cast. Uh, they, they try to they try to implant doubt into your mind as to the as to the inspiration of the Scripture. And they're and they're out there. And I I feel sorry for a young man that goes off, and uh, and has that happen to him because it'll if they can destroy your faith in the book, you don't have any faith. It's gone. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by experience. See, I messed up, didn't I? I'm glad you caught me. What does it say? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing what? Exactly. And this, sanctify them truth by thy truth. Thy is truth. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. <laughs> mm-hmm. That liveth and abideth forever. Amen. I hope you never hear come out of my mouth anything that would cause you to doubt God's word. Never. I want no part of it. And uh, because I believe the Bible. Amen. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, what all we've been talking about tonight be helped somebody. I pray it'll be a help to them. Lord, I know we can get into a lot of technical stuff in here tonight, Father, and, and, and sometimes get out so far that to people lose what we're talking about. But Father, of all the things I said tonight, I'm going to try to make it very simple, that you gave to the Jews, you gave to them, to that one group of people, the transmission of Scripture, and that we have it today because you gave it to them. And we're thankful for it, Lord. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I appreciate you listening. Uh, I went to see Nancy Owsley today and uh